This is a Mike's Movies presentation and we shall be covering the history of Worcester Infirmary from the first primitive house in Silver Street up to its demolition. Early medicine was practiced just using whatever was about. There'd be the medicine man or the witch doctor and they thought that plants that were shaped like parts of the human body uh, could be used to repair those parts when they went wrong. In 1740, the first moves were made in Worcester to provide an infirmary, but this was simply one house, which in fact still exists as part of a block in Silver Street. In 1743, Isaac Maddox, who had been a bishop in London, came to Worcester. He'd been involved with hospitals in London and decided he would do something about setting one up for Worcester. Dr. John Wall of Worcester Porcelain fame joined him to found the first infirmary. As was usual at the time, a request was made for public subscriptions. A house in Silver Street was obtained for rent. Soon the house next door was acquired and they were able to take in more patients. Here you can see the dilapidated state of the rear of the building being propped up with scaffolding. And it's all been done up now and become usable premises. There was no running water in the building until 1745. In 1746, the infirmary opened in Silver Street, supposed to accommodate 30 patients, but seldom that number because of the lack of funds and the cold and damp of the house. And a cook was not appointed until 1749 at a salary of £3 per annum. On taking over the next door house, they raised the bed complement to 48. And in the first three years, there were almost a thousand admissions. The infirmary was popular, but the accommodation hopelessly inadequate if the work was to survive. Thomas Bourne, apothecary, £15 per annum. John King, secretary, £10 per annum. Mrs White, matron, £6 per annum. Nurse Gosling, £3.10 per annum. Nurse Whetstone, £3.10 per annum. Who was later discharged as incompetent, and she was only 20. And Patience Perry, who was the maid, at £3 per annum. Smoking, swearing, and card or dice playing were strictly forbidden. All the staff had five shillings for a Christmas box, with matron having ten shillings, and Nurse Gosling's salary was increased to four pounds ten. By 1751, the infirmary had become famous mainly for Dr. Wall's treatment of sore throats, scarlet fever and diphtheria. He was also one of the first to diagnose angina pectoris as a symptom of heart disease. During the 18th century, research and training improved, and, but there were no cures for diseases like smallpox, a disease that killed millions of people over thousands of years. This is where a British doctor, Edward Jenner, noticed that milkmaids who got the cowpox disease from cows didn't get smallpox, and he developed a vaccination with the fluid from the cowpox sore that protected people from the deadly disease. One of the most important developments that followed on in the 19th century was that uh, they discovered that diseases, as well as infection of surgical wounds, was directly caused by minute living organisms. 
and this changed the whole face of pathology and effected a complete revolution in the practice of surgery. By 1760, the infirmary was treating up to a thousand people a year. The admission of poor patients to the hospital, however, was strictly limited to those who had been referred by the local surgeon with a letter of support. Only 60 beds were available in the hospital during this period and patients were only admitted to the Worcester General Infirmary on Saturdays at 11 a.m. By 1760 there were urgent needs for repairs and expansion. The bread house was falling down, snow was coming through the roof of the matron's office and there were patients in her sitting room. A new infirmary was needed. And so in the middle of the 1760s, it was decided to put up an entirely new building on the outskirts of the city. Advice was obtained from Edward Garlick of Bristol, who had experience in starting Bristol hospitals. The site was found on the south side of Castle Street, then known as Salt Lane. Garlick gave the £200 for its purchase and the new building was erected at a cost of £6,085 and the patients were transferred on Silver Street on the 17th of December 1771. In 1851 Jenny Lind, who was known as the Swedish Nightingale, gave concerts and raised enough money to build a chapel. This released a room on the second floor, which had served as a chapel and at other times as an operating room. In 1865, the raising of the roof converted the attics into proper wards and the bed complement was brought up to 100. There was no outpatients and they were just seen in odd rooms off the main hall. In 1874, the outpatients department was built between the north end of the building and Castle Street. And at the same time, the laundry and the cottage were built. The latter to act as an infection isolation unit. A full report on this case is available on Mike's Movies on Facebook under Files. The original small outpatients department was enlarged upwards along Castle Street, almost to Infirmary Walk in 1912. In 1932, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VIII, came to open the new nurses' home the new pathology department and the new operating theatre and orthopaedic block. Until then, from 1745, the name of the hospital had been Worcester General Infirmary. But on his visit, His Royal Highness announced that his father, King George V, had given permission for the word Royal to be included in the name, which then became Worcester Royal Infirmary. 
a new A&E department was opened in 1969. There was no nurses' home until the end of the 19th century, and nurses just slept in small rooms wherever available and often attached to their walls. Grove House, situated at the corner of Infirmary Walk, was bequeathed to the infirmary in 1892, was equipped as a nursing home, but proved unsatisfactory. So it was sold and the money put towards the building of a proper nurses' home within the grants of the infirmary, and this was opened in 1897, the present Mulberry House. A new home was opened in 1932, and the old one became the domestics home, and after World War II, when there were no living in domestics, it was converted into flats for married residential medical staff. In 